Good morning. Good Good to have you this morning for our worship service together on this uh, beautiful Ohio winter morning. And uh, it's great to worship with you. Invite you just to take a moment, prepare your hearts, create a little bit of time and space for us to uh, respond to God's invitation to come and to worship. So would you take just a moment, maybe pray a prayer or just silence your heart. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory has appeared to all of the earth with the birth of his Son. All of you who would praise him, prepare your hearts for worship. All of you who would find him, prepare your souls to seek him out. And all of you who would listen to him, prepare your minds to encounter the truth. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. Praise God for the gift of the Son. Let us lift up our many voices and praise the God of all people. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome from God our Father, who gave us his Son as the fulfillment of his faithful promises to bring salvation into our world. Amen. May the peace that comes from this gift of God's faithful promise be with you in abundance. And also Today we join with generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today's reading is Psalm 147. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. He 
Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord give us the downtrodden. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. <laughs> Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Praise the Lord. The Word has become flesh and dwelt among us. Our God is not distant from us. Our God has embraced our weaknesses and shared in our sorrows. Let us then draw near to God's throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Living God, you bid us welcome and choose a new way of life. You choose to do life with us so that we might choose to do life with you. So we choose the way of loving others rather than the way of hatred and strife. We choose the way of forgiveness rather than the way of bitterness. The way of kindness rather than the way of indifference. We choose the way of faith that leads to the cross rather than the way of selfishness. We choose the way of remembering your faithfulness and mercy rather than forgetting that you are good. Thank you for choosing us and choosing to do life with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take a moment of silent prayers of reflection. Amen. The miracle of God's love for us is shown to us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was truly God, did not seek to remain equal with God, but instead gave up everything, becoming a slave when he became like one of us. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Take a moment to greet each other with God's grace.
Would you bow your heads with me and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture, words that were written down for us, words written for our admonition, words written to offer to us instruction and training in righteousness, words written to give us hope. We ask now that you would grant us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand that which you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text today uh, continues where we were yesterday, uh, last week. It continues on in the book of Mark chapter 1. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her, and he came, and he took her up by the hand and lifted her up, and her fever left. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. Rising early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Well, we've been, uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been using some logos, some um, brilliantly designed logos, to try to help you to see that there is more to see than what you think you see. In fact, most of us go through life and we see things and we just kind of move. Life comes at us so rapidly and there's so much stimulation of the eyes anymore that you see things and then you just keep right on going. But in doing that, you don't really see. There's more to be seen. And that's what the whole Gospel of Mark is. I'm, I'm amazed because in the first 20 verses of Mark, now think about this for a second, in the first 20 verses of the Gospel of Mark. John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness. Jesus arrives on the scene. Jesus then goes from there out into the wilderness. Jesus leaves the wilderness and comes back into uh, uh, Peter and, and Andrew and James and John's town. And there he calls them to come and follow him. All of that takes place in 20 verses. Mark is moving quickly. You keep encountering this word immediately in the text. So last week we looked up through verse 20. And we saw that the Spirit helps people reveal, helps people to see the revealed Jesus or helps reveal Jesus to people and draws us to follow. The, the story was very abrupt. Jesus sees these four fishermen and he tells them to come and follow him. And they drop their nets, and they leave their families, and they follow him. We don't know why. 
We don't know what it was, but there's something to be seen in that. There's something that the Spirit of God is revealing to them that it is worth leaving their occupation, leaving their family, and going and following this one who is unknown. Always playing in the background in Mark's Gospel is the unknown Jesus. So we looked at that, how the Spirit reveals and then calls us or draws us into a relationship with Christ. Today we're going to look at what happens right after that as Jesus encounters demonic activity in a synagogue, heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then ministers to an entire village that turns out. Today we're going to look at the revealing of Jesus through the instrument of healing and power that calls us to obedience. You know, you and I live in a scientific world. There's, there's no doubt about it. From the time of the Enlightenment on, we've been on this course that gets us to a scientific world. Everything is scientific. There's a scientific or rational explanation for everything that happens. But that is not the world of Scripture. That is not the world of faith. I'm not suggesting that science is, is taboo. I, I don't believe that. I believe science is solid. I believe it's, it's there. It, it, is, it is discovering basic frameworks of what makes life work. But necessary to a faith in Christ Jesus is the idea that not everything can be explained by science. Science has kind of moved in and it controls the narrative that faith used to. For instance, back in ancient days when there was a drought, it was because God caused the rain to stop. Or if there was some sort of catastrophe, it was because God orchestrated that. God was, the, was the, 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 the purpose or the reason behind all of that. Now, if it doesn't, if it doesn't make rational sense, we just dismiss it. But today's text calls us to see something more. It calls us to go beyond just a scientific understanding of our world. It calls us not just to dismiss what we don't understand as fantasy or myth. It calls us to look and see who Jesus is. It invites us to see Jesus as the catalyst or the point man for the coming of the kingdom of God onto this earth. And in doing so, it shows us that Jesus has the power to make things right through healing or through casting out demons, Jesus is doing something in our world. He has the power to change life. And if he has that power, then we must respond to that power through obedience. Let's look at our story. The story is an amazing story because it moves. It just keep, Mark is doing that. Everything just moves, moves, moves. What takes Luke chapters takes Mark a few verses causing us to see, reveal who Jesus is. Jesus enters a synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now the synagogue, maybe you, you may not be aware of this, but in that world, the synagogue was an alternative to the temple. The temple was located in one place and that was Jerusalem. Synagogues were located in localities. They were located in most or many of the villages or towns of significant size. And they were the gathering places for the people of God to come and worship. Not everyone could worship on a daily basis at the temple, or even a weekly basis, or even an annual basis. So synagogues were formed back when the temple was destroyed as alternative worship sites. And every Sabbath day, the people of God would gather for worship. And there, part of the worship, there would be some sort of reciting of a psalm, similar to what we do. There would be prayers offered. And then a rabbi would come and he would read a text. It's interesting, in that day and time, they would stand to read the text. And everyone would stand to listen to the text because it is God speaking. And then once the text was read, everybody would sit down and so would the speaker. Because now the speaker isn't delivering God's word, the speaker is delivering the speaker's words. So God's word was elevated by everyone standing, the speaker would sit and would begin to enunciate. 
his words regarding the text that was read. So Jesus enters the synagogue and he is the rabbi for the day. He takes the role of the teacher. His teaching, as he's teaching, people are marveling at, they're listening to it. It's, it's like someone who speaks with authority. Someone whose words are powerfully orated. Someone who, when they speak, his audience is captivated. It's the preacher's dream, you know, the people are just sitting there like, wow. When Jesus speaks, life happens. He's not like so many of the others who had spoken before. Not like all the experts. He's somebody who when he speaks, there's something different. All of a sudden he's interrupted. There is a man who has a demonic spirit and he begins to rant about Jesus. The demon knows who Jesus is. No one else at this time knows exactly who Jesus is, but the demon knows. The demon cries out through this man, you are Jesus of Nazareth. Now everybody there would have known that. That was common knowledge. And then the demon says, you are the Holy One of Israel, or you're the Holy One of God. That was secret knowledge. No one knew that Jesus at this point is the Holy One of God except for the demon that has existed in this man. You see, the presence of Jesus heightened demonic activity in people. I want you to think of it in terms of this because it's part of our world we look at it and say, oh, wait, wait a minute. It's not rational. If you and I were to go to the hospital to the emergency room. Let's, let's just say we're going to go all the way into Toledo, to Toledo Hospital, to the emergency room. And we're going to live there. We're just going to live in the emergency room. All you would see is a bunch of sick people, hurt people. You would see every kind of sickness, every kind of hurt, every type of accident. You would see all kinds of people in really bad shape, right? That's what emergency rooms are for, people who are really in bad shape, they end up going there. If you live there, you would begin to think everybody is either sick or in bad shape. Because that's all you would see. Jesus is like the emergency room. Jesus represents the kingdom of God. He is the point person on this kingdom. And so he begins to attract, like an emergency room attracts those who are sick, those who have needs, those who are ill. Jesus attracts the powers that are against the kingdom of God. He is like a magnet that draws them. And so you see in the gospels, Jesus over and over and over again, ministering to people who have evil spirits. It's not like the whole world, everybody in the world has them, but in the Gospels, it's a heightened sense because Jesus represents the kingdom of God and there is a kingdom that is opposed to that. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our, our, our struggles aren't with each other but they're with principalities and powers, rulers of darkness over this world. That's who we struggle with. There, there's, there's evil in the world. Don't think for a second that those who are insane don't have some sort of demonic activity that could be driving that. Or those who are truly evil, those who would go and do a mass murder, or those like Dr. Nasser up in Michigan who abuse so many. Don't think that there isn't demonic activity involved in all of that. We try to bear through all of that or drill through all that to a rational understanding. But there are evil powers in the world. They oppose the things of God. There are institutions of power. Both political parties are institutions of power. And don't think for a second that there isn't powers of darkness that somehow influence that. Or Hollywood or any institution that has some sort of influence or power over people. Don't for a second think that they're just some neutral entity out there. The whole thing of Epiphany tells us that our world was in darkness and Jesus comes in as the light. 
So here's this evil spirit. I know you. Why are you here? Jesus of Nazareth. Holy One of God. It's at the mention of the Holy One of God that Jesus commands the demon to be quiet. What he has just, what this demon has just uttered is secret. Mark has this thing that we call the messianic secret. It runs throughout the whole Gospel of Mark. Nobody knows who Jesus is, and Jesus keeps telling everybody who does know to be quiet. So in this case, as soon as this evil spirit announces Jesus is the Holy One of God, Jesus commands its silence and then casts it out of this man. Mark keeps Jesus from being fully revealed until the cross. And what's interesting about the Gospel of Mark, if you read it through, nobody knows. The disciples don't even really know who Jesus is. Not until the cross, not until he has died, not until the temple veil is rent in two, and the centurion says, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, there are people throughout, and there are evil spirits who know, but Jesus always tells them to be quiet. He says, silence. To some, he said, tell no one after they were healed. Don't go and tell anybody about this. Or he orders them not to make him known. People are always asking, who is this? Mark is trying to show us that we think we see Jesus. But there's something more to see in Jesus. There is something more to be revealed. You could say, ah, I know Jesus. You can know the logos. And then all of a sudden you see something in the logo that stands out that you didn't see before. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's what Mark is trying to get us to see. People are marveling because the spirit comes out of this man. The man cries out. The spirit comes out. And people are saying he taught with authority and he even commands evil forces. And they listen and they obey. Who is this person? So Mark is not content to camp out there. Immediately he takes uh, uh, Jesus and he marches him into Simon Peter's house. And there Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Peter was married. His mother-in-law is sick with a fever. So Jesus heals her. And she begins to serve them, doing what she loved doing. And then at evening, on the Sabbath, when people could move freely, the whole village turns out to Peter's house. And everyone who is sick and everyone who is afflicted by evil spirits come, and Jesus heals them all. You know what's amazing about the text? Is that with the man who was in the synagogue with the evil spirit, with Simon Peter's mother-in-law and the whole village that shows up, they don't have to do anything. They don't ask Jesus to heal them. They don't make some request. There's no action on their part. Jesus initiates it. Mark wants us to see that Jesus has the power to fix life. Jesus has the power over darkness. And if Jesus has that kind of power, then we need to listen, and we need to follow, and we need to obey. The text, once it gets to the village portion, is really interesting because it says that they, all, they come to Peter's house and Jesus heals them all. And then it says he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. There's that secret again. They knew him, and he doesn't want people to know. He doesn't want at this point. He wants the revelation to, to not be centered on a Jesus that is somehow short of the cross. So we have to keep moving with Mark through this beautiful gospel story. And finally, when we see Jesus at the cross, we begin to understand who he is. We don't know how long he prayed for people. We don't know how long he ministered that evening. But early in the morning, 
he is found in a deserted place having a time of prayer. The disciples find him. Peter, and they're looking all over for him because everybody is coming. This thing is moving. It's happening. Can you imagine? You're just somebody who has just joined the official Jesus entourage. And the whole village has been healed. And now word is getting out. And people are coming from everywhere. I mean, this is superstar material. Jesus, everybody is looking for you. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, we need to move on from here. We need to go and tell other villages the good news because that's why I came to preach. It makes no sense. Disciples are thinking, man, we're just getting this thing rolling. Church is hopping. Everybody's talking. And you want to what? Move on? That is the text. He says, I came to preach the gospel. Throughout this text, Mark is showing us the obvious truth that Jesus has the power to fix life. But he maintains this sense of mystery because you and I can never be satisfied with the Jesus that we think we know. There is always more to see. Let's see if I got this right. Years ago, the Pittsburgh Zoo had a logo. This served their zoo for a long, long time. It was a pretty plain logo, don't you think? Kind of drab, actually. When you see that, you think, that's zoo, right? That just speaks to zoo. That could be anything. You could have your name up on that, and it would speak the same thing, right? So the zoo said, we want a different logo. We want something that kind of brings the wild side out. And so the zoo commissioned for there to be a new logo. And this is the logo. It's an amazing logo. You see the birds up here, and you see this tree. You kind of imagine this tree being somehow from the savanna of Africa, right? And you see down here at the bottom, here's a bunch of fish. It looks like they're jumping up out of the water. Here's the wave on the water. That looks more zoo than the other one, doesn't it? Doesn't that look like more of a zoo than that? It's a pretty amazing logo, really. What's really brilliant about the logo is the gorilla and the lion. That's what's really amazing. You saw it, right? Everybody here saw it. You're starting to look for these things. You're no fair anymore. It's no fun. You see the gorilla and the lion? The shape of the tree is created by the gorilla and the lion. You thought you saw the tree. You thought you, you thought you saw the logo. Now you're seeing the logo. It's amazing. That really looks like a zoo, doesn't it? You say, I'm having a hard time seeing that up on the top left. Does that help you? All of a sudden you see. Julie, do you see? <laughs> this here is a lo uh, the gorilla's face in white. He's a mean looking gorilla. He's looking across at the lion over here. Julie's going, ah, I see. Okay, we're able to move on. Yeah. This this right here was their this right here was their logo. Somebody said, we want this to speak to who we are. And you look at it and you just take it for granted. I guarantee you you will never be able to see that logo without seeing the gorilla and the lion because once you've seen it you can't not see it that's what mark calls us to with the gospel calls us to keep looking after jesus 
to see who Jesus is. And once we do, we realize that Jesus is more than we ever, ever imagined. Jesus is someone who is revealed by the Holy Spirit. And with this, there's this calling to us. And we begin to follow. There are some people who never see that. Why would you worship? Why would you follow this Jesus? Makes no sense. It's like looking at the logo, saying that's just a logo. But there's more. Jesus is not only someone revealed by the Holy Spirit who then calls us to follow. Mark wants to see Jesus revealed as the Lord of all with power. And with that comes a call to obey. A call to make Jesus Lord of our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words. We thank you for the gift of giving us your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we've heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Professing our faith in the living God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Sandy and Sue, if you are ready, wait on our people. We will receive our offering. prayer. For all that you have given to us, for all you have done, we are most grateful. Receive our offerings of thanks in our hearts of love and devotion. Amen. You may be seated. Let us take our time and now go before the Lord our God with our prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that the revelation of Jesus, the mystery of God coming to this earth to be human, to live life with us, is unfolding before our eyes. Our world desperately needs that Jesus. Father, we pray that you would minister in our world. We pray for those who lead, who govern, who have power, who have authority, who can use a power and authority for evil purposes, for self-serving purposes, can use power and authority to put others down, cause pain and inflict suffering upon others. We pray, Father, that through your spirit, hearts of leaders would be turned, that that power might be used to lift up all people. We pray, Father, for peace in our world. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling. We pray, Father, for those who have been hurt, devastated by the actions of others. We pray, Father, for those who the consequences for what is going on in their world leaves them no choice but to flee, to find refuge someplace else. 
We pray, Father, for our communities, those places where we live, those who surround us, that light might come to them, that our world would know who Jesus is. We pray for those who are in authority in the communities in which we live. Help them to serve us. Help, us to serve the, help them to serve the purposes of your kingdom. We also pray this day for those who are upon our hearts, family members, friends, loved ones, those who we are acquainted with who are struggling, who are suffering, who are hurting, who are lonely. We pray, Father, as we lift their names before your throne, we ask you to hear our prayers. Father, as these names have been brought before your throne, cover these now with your love and with your presence. Send your spirit. Send your grace and your mercy, your loving kindness. Send your presence into these lives, we pray. Father, we thank you for these things. As we've lifted them before you, we pray in the name of Jesus the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord our God make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.
may we be a people who see the Lord for all that he is and we follow and obey. Go in peace for we are. Amen.